Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. We've just got people filtering in. It's lovely to see you all. Um, while everybody's coming in, I'll just quickly talk you through the very familiar these days Zoom logistics, which is um, we will keep you muted. But please do keep your um, video on if you don't mind. It's nice to feel some level of digital connection with people. But obviously, if you're multitasking and folding up baby's clothes at the same time, feel free to keep yourself off the screen if you wish. Um, we're just letting people come in now. Hi, it's nice to see some familiar faces and some that I don't know. Hi. Uh, and as a reminder, this session, like all the sessions in the Food Power Conference, are being recorded. Um, it doesn't mean that I won't swear, but it does mean that you don't have to take notes. All right, still got a few people in the waiting room, so we'll just let everybody trickle in um, before I get started properly. I'm delighted to be joined today by two genuine experts while I rattle through and try to claim the same. <laughs> Okay, I think we will crack on. Cecily, give me a thumbs up if you think that we are good to go. We've got a few people in the waiting room. Great, okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for a session on climate change and food poverty. I'm delighted to be presenting this session and acting as overall chair. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Fiona McAllister from the Capital Growth Project at Sustain, give us a wave, Fee, thank you. And Meesbeth from Nourish Scotland, give us a wave. Meesbeth, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with an overall sort of scene setter about climate change and food and how this relates to the challenge of food poverty. Um, and then I will move over to Fee and Miesbeth to talk about some quite sort of specific and inspiring projects that can operate really well at the nexus between food poverty and climate change. And then there'll be time for questions and some general chat about what um, about some projects that you might have going as well. If you'd like to start by uh, saying hello in the chat, please do. Where are you from? What's your name? And hello to everybody. And while you're doing that, I'll kick off with my slides. So I'm just gonna share screen, which means that I'll just go quiet for a second while I faff. Um, I hope you can all see the screen. Cecily, again, give me a thumbs down if you can't, otherwise I'll assume this is working. Right, let's move you over there. It's good. Thank you. Oh, I meant to say, so regarding questions, please drop questions in the chat as we go along, although we will probably come to them at the end of the sessions just to help make things move smoothly. Okay, so this is me, Ruth Westcott. I'm the uh, Climate and Nature Emergency Coordinator at Sustain. If you don't follow us on Twitter, please do. Um, I've been doing this uh, role for just, just about a year now um, and starting to crack on with some campaigns and projects um, around climate change and food at Sustain. So what is the problem? Well, as you can see from this illustration, Food and agriculture account for roughly 20% of global emissions. If we also include food waste and some of that chunk of the transportation emissions, you can see that actually we quite comfortably get over the 25% that is attributable to electricity and heat. And therefore the food system overall is the biggest contributor to climate change. We must remember, of course, that we're, we're talking about a climate and nature emergency. And when we're talking about the food system, it's especially important to remember that whenever we talk about a climate emergency, we talk about it in the context of climate and nature. And that's because the food system is by far the biggest um, contributor to the loss of biodiversity and the nature emergency, especially from habitat loss and pollution. And you can see from this graph on the left that the food system there by far the biggest contributor to um, habitat loss and degradation, which is leading to biodiversity loss globally. Now, when we talk about food as, as a climate emitter, actually what we're talking about is a few food products which contribute disproportionately to the problem. And as you can see there, 
beef by far, you know, just about twice as big a climate impact as the next one down, which is lamb and mutton. And what I think is, is good, you know, the three key points to take from this graph are, first of all, beef by far the biggest impact. Secondly, this, this graph is, I like this graph because it looks at the greenhouse gas emissions across the supply chain. And we can see from this that actually that gray chunk, which would be packaging, and the pink chunk, which is transport, are relatively minor in terms of the climate change contribution. Actually, the biggest problem that we're looking at is land use change and farming impacts. It doesn't mean that we should just ignore packaging, obviously, and, and ignore food miles, but right crop, right place, and less and better meat are the two key messages to take home when it comes to food and climate change. The other thing is that um, it's worth mentioning that this, this graph actually makes chicken and fish look like pretty good climate options because they do come down as, as quite low emissions. But this, this chart does not include the impact of antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance on, and also the threat of future zoonotic diseases, which chicken is a really big influencer of, and fish habitat loss and, de and marine degradation from um, overfishing. So it's worth remembering that those are a problem as well. However, not all meat is created equal. It is a bit more complicated than that graph would suggest. Um, Low impact beef systems, which are agroecological, um, like pasture fed, actually come in and, 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 and measure quite comparably to, to moderate impact cheese and even, even sort of within the same range as beer. So it's worth remembering that even within beef and lamb and, and other meat products, just saying ban beef is a bit oversimplistic and actually different farming systems have a very variable impact. I think it's also worth picking out here that chocolate and actually they haven't listed coffee. Oh, they have coffee here. Disproportionately big impacts and a big range. And that's why also fair trade is very important to make sure that you try to reduce the emissions um, from uh, land use change. Food waste is responsible for about 6% of global emissions. And we have, you know, the conversation about food waste has changed, has become more visible recently. But invisible food waste, the part that we don't see, actually is the biggest contributor. There's an estimated 3 to 10% of waste comes from supermarket over ordering and cosmetic raiding. So all that emphasis and the brilliant Love Food Hate Waste campaigns and everything that are talking about individual behavior and not throwing away bread crusts and so on are fantastic but we also must remember that a big part of the problem is supermarkets and feedback the food waste charity are campaigning to make it mandatory that supermarkets should um, at least measure their food waste and that's a great campaign to support they feed feed they did this this um report that i mentioned here actually estimates that supermarket demand for overproduction is 10 to 16 percent. So supermarkets are producing between 10 and 16 percent more food than they need just to make sure that they overproduce so that our supermarket shelves are always full. Now it's, it's impossible really to talk about climate change, especially in the context of poverty, without thinking about colonialism and the history of, um, of imperialism that has left us with both the consequences of climate change and disproportionate impacts of climate change across the world. Climate determinism, climate determinism is a term that refers to this idea that certain climates and certain places with certain weather systems are predisposed to a particular development journey simply because of their climate. So we often see pictures of, you know, this is this, these images of drought ridden and famine ridden areas in the world are often portrayed as being part of the natural system. Like it's natural that some areas are more vulnerable to famine and drought because of their climate. And that narrative has disproportionately undervalued the impact of multinational corporations and power in the food system and disproportionate access to resources and wealth, which are the real underlying consequences of famine and drought. 
And that climate determinism has been used throughout colonial history, but it's continuing today. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in this topic, and we all should be, to look at Climate in Colour, which is a new resource about the history of colonialism um, and climate change. It's an absolutely brilliant resource. There's a link to it here. And I'll share the slides afterwards so that you can see that. Climate science itself began as a way to map out the best places to colonize to address trade imbalances. So climate science and climate change understanding itself comes with a, with a history of colonialism. And again, that continues to this day. Paternalism in climate science is still a problem. Um, throughout history, Western science has been given precedence over other forms of knowledge particularly in agriculture and land management. And we are, you know, starting to see the consequences of that sort of Western science imposition on different environments across the world. And one of the most famous examples is that in California, indigenous communities have been managing the land through controlled firing for generations. And since that practice was banned, California has been subject to some of the worst forest fires in history. And only now are they starting to look at the indigenous land management practices as better ways to manage than just ignoring the problem and hoping that it goes away. And neocolonialism continues today. We see continuously that the solutions to climate change are presented as ways that will continue the success of the wealthy rather than benefiting the people that need that deserve um, differential power structures. So, and some of those that are the most pressing for food are land grabbing for agriculture. And we're seeing this more and more, even Bill Gates and, and, um, and, and billionaires, particularly US billionaires are buying up land. And, but let's not blame just the US because lots of the multinational corporations responsible have headquarters in the UK and the profits will stream into the West and continue to, um, cause food insecurity in the areas that are already most at risk. Um, Biopiracy is a particular problem. Um, companies buying up patents to seeds and chemicals to both control their use and control their profits. So it's again continuing the control of um, the global south for the benefit of the global north. And I would encourage you to, um, to look at Vandana Shiva's work on this. She's absolutely amazing. YouTube or read the book. I'm more of a YouTube person these days, but I'd obviously encourage you to read the book. Um, in the UK, I think the most pressing example of this is the, is the discussion around deforestation. When in most uh, discussions about deforestation, we hear the Global South sort of blamed for deforestation, when actually we're Boris Johnson will say this from a pedestal standing in the country that is one of the most nature deprived in the whole world, which is the UK. Um, since he's come to power, he's, Boris Johnson has announced funding for protecting forests across the world and oceans across the world. And yet our own marine conservation network is worse than useless. And we are currently in a state of deforestation in the UK. So. Again, the UK government is still trying to use its own power to control the environment overseas whilst failing to do so well enough in the UK. Climate inequality is already increasing poverty in the UK. The area that this has been most evident so far is actually, I think, air pollution. And already air pollution is causing millions of lost working days per year and we know because of, we've seen through covid that the people that are most at risk by not being able to go into work or at risk for missing days at work or losing their job is people that are already on lower incomes and we also know that the poor are the most exposed to air pollution and that and that the air pollution is disproportionately caused by the rich and um, I live in Southwark and the Southwark coroner found recently that um, the death of Ella Kissy Deborah was a factor in that death was air pollution caused by climate change. And that's been a landmark case. And I hope that that has started to make more evident the fact that people are already dying from climate change in the UK. And it's not something that we can continue to talk about as something which might happen in the future. 
But it's not just air pollution, of course. The food prices have already food price rises have already been attributable to weather and climate change, particularly in extreme weather in 2018. But this is due to get worse, of course, because of Brexit. And whilst we know that food price rises are not the cause of food poverty, inevitably the poorest will suffer from food price rises the most, um, as will flooding. And that's already been the case in the floods in 2019 and the 2016 and 2017. So we're in a situation now, I think, where there's this gross mismatch between the importance of food in climate change and the importance that it is given by government as a priority in tackling climate change. There has literally been nothing from Boris Johnson since he took office on changing diets, barely anything on farming and the environment bill has been delayed four times now. We are seeing a complete lack, a, a silence on food and diets from the government at the moment. When there was a rumour barely more than a rumour in the backbenches about a food, a meat tax. Boris Johnson came out with a statement to say, pretty much over my dead body, rather than using that as an opportunity to start a conversation about how we might incentivise through pricing more climate friendly products or make more climate friendly foods more available to more people, he slapped down a meat tax and said, we will not affect your sausages. Um, our environment minister has no plan to meet the uh, government's net zero targets. One of the only sectors to do, one of the only government departments to do so, which is shambolic, given that it is literally the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. But I'm actually feeling quite positive about that because he has copped some political heat for that. So I actually think that's quite helpful. So in that context of sort of national inaction, Sustain is looking to do some local action instead. And we are planning to produce, well, in the process of producing a toolkit for local authorities, which will set out their role in tackling food and climate change and give councils the associated climate benefits so in tons of CO2 equivalent for taking different actions that they have the power over in their local area. And this here is just an excerpt from the land use farming and planning section of that toolkit. It's being designed at the moment and it's due to be released June to July time. Um, and we'll of course be in touch when that comes out, but it should be a really good tool for local authorities to understand and realize their power over the food system and climate change locally. And then of course, we've got the national food strategy, which is due in summer. And I would encourage you to keep a lookout for that. Climate change is, is on the agenda for this food strategy. And we've heard some fairly positive things about that, although I suspect it won't be as ambitious as we would like. So that brings me to the solution. So of course, through this talk, I've tried to emphasize the fact that um, the problem of climate change is not individuals choosing to eat too much beef, but the global political and economic system, which undermines the resource base upon which it depends. And that's great. However, when it comes to us thinking about what we might do to solve this, taking down capitalism perhaps is not something that we can think about today or tomorrow. So here are some ideas that where I think that the crossover exists and the opportunities that are present now. The first is making fruit and veg more accessible, affordable and attractive. As we saw from that diagram, of course, agroecological is brilliant and local is the best. But ultimately, if you're encouraging any projects which are encouraging increased uptake of fruit and veg and helping to reduce meat in diets are going to have a huge impact on climate change. And I've put some statistics there. Every meal switched from high meat to vegetarian saves about one kilogram of CO2. And it might not sound like an awful lot, but across, for example, the school meals in a local authority, that climate change difference is comparable to switching the your whole bus fleet to hydrogen buses. Um, and that's just switching to, uh, you know, that's just the small amount that's on school meals. Um, locally sourced produce has a four to 45 percent lower emissions than supermarket equivalent. So anything that you can do to help local food get into communities is beneficial to the climate. Um, and each tonne of food waste diverted from landfill saves an estimated 2.63 tonnes of CO2. So any projects that you're doing locally, which is helping to divert food from um, food waste, you can, certainly can use as a part of a climate change strategy locally. And if that can help make 
food redistribution projects have an impact and you know demonstrate their impact locally then I think climate change is a really good way of doing that. Community food growing reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 34 tonnes per hectare per year. That's based on a life cycle analysis of a community farm in Sutton. So again, um, local authorities that have a climate change strategy really should be seeing food growing as part of the solution to climate change and building it into their local climate change plans. Um, now, I just wanted to refer you to some opportunities for a bit of cash for this work because my colleague Ren has written an absolutely brilliant blog, which is linked to here, which talks through some of the cash that the government is giving out for renewal funds and um, build back better. And they nearly all of them mention responding to climate change and have environment within them and can be relevant to food. So that I think there is some opportunity here for local projects that can come in the, in the joint between climate and food poverty and this funding available. So I won't go into them too much here, but I would urge you to read that blog. It talks through the, the deadlines um, and what kind of things that funding is available for. Um, the Towns Fund obviously is the biggest one. Those 45 towns have already been um, assigned the money, but it's definitely worth checking if you have one in your local area because they're still drawing up plans for how to spend the money and there's an opportunity to influence that to introduce um, some new ideas. The other option is tree planting. The government has a ridiculous target of 30,000 hectares of new woodland in England by 2025 and they just announced a new fund which I mean originally I was quite skeptical of this tree planting because I suspected it was an opportunity to give the landowning gentry money to plant trees on their acres of land that wouldn't be accessible or beneficial to local communities but they have actually just announced uh, a tree fund for local communities which is non-woodland trees so that could be agroforestry uh, or uh, community orchards or increasing the prevalence of fruit and nut trees in things like parks so I'd urge you to check that out the announcement there's not much announced yet it was only a couple of weeks ago that that was announced So I hope that has given something of a whistle-stop overview of food and climate change. Without further ado, I would like, oh, hang on a minute. I will not pass you over yet. We've got a, just let me stop screen sharing. Give me a second. Before I move on to Fiona, I would really like to just give you the opportunity to, um, to, to answer a quick question on Mentimeter which to tell, give you the opportunity to tell us any specific projects that you're doing locally that sit in this um, juncture between food and climate change. So I will hand over to Cecily to do the Mentimeter if that is okay with you. Uh, hi everyone. So um, the question is is quite a simple one. It's just um, what, how are you connecting food poverty and climate change in your local areas? And whilst we continue with the other presentations, I've put the link to the Mentimeter as well as the code if you want to join on your phone so you don't have to multi-screen. Um, so that's now in the chat. So if you just head to that link, let us know what you're up to and we'll come back to it at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. So if you just if you wouldn't mind just filling that in, I'll have a look while the uh, other presentations are happening and hopefully we can come back to that in the chat at the end. So without further ado, I'd love to pass you over to my colleague Fiona from Capital Growth. Um, Capital Growth is one is an absolutely fantastic project that brings together food and climate change. And I won't explain too much more. I'll pass over. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, well, I feel like I'm about to change. Yeah, it's such a brilliant start to this afternoon session, Ruth, um, and I learned a lot as well. So thank you for that. And I feel like I'm about to change the tone quite a bit because I'm about to bombard you with some pictures of really nice community gardens. <laughs> um, so I'll just share my screen now. Um, but there is a reason that I'm going to show you pictures of, a, of community gardens. So if you just bear with me a second. Um, can Cecily and Ruth, can you see my screen? Fantastic. Um, so I'm really happy to be here for this discussion about the links uh, between food poverty and climate. And I think Ruth has, you know, demonstrated uh, 
really kind of succinctly how important this topic is and something that we all need to be wrapping our heads around so much more and talking about so much more. So thanks again, uh, Ruth, for inviting me. And really my aim today is to hopefully just inspire some of you folks about a very practical way to uh, tackle, I think, both of these issues um, on a local and community level and something that may not even be on your radar. And I'm referring to the power of community food growing. So you may be thinking, how does growing a few carrots uh, really address the serious and you know real challenges of our time and I'm here to tell you that at a local level it, it really can and food growing is a worthy piece of the jigsaw puzzle in helping to make a difference when it comes to alleviating food poverty and addressing our climate and nature emergency. So in the short time I have with you today I hope to cover um, the following. I want to tell you, give you a little whistle stop tour of the food growing network I coordinate in London Capital Growth, uh, how we started, why we do what we do and what we've learned along the way. Um, I'll then zoom into the last 14 months and uh, basically how community food growing projects have really stepped up and responded to the crisis, uh, the pandemic and addressed food poverty and the climate emergency, I think. Um, I'll bring in the potential for peri-urban farming here too. Um, and then I'd like to finish by telling you about a really exciting new project that we're starting um, to unpick uh, the links between food growing and climate and community resilience. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Capital Growth. Uh, we're a campaign that was launched uh, by the chair of the London Food Board, food Board and Sustain um, to help create 2012 community food growing spaces by the end of the Olympic year and the good news is we achieved that aim um, very much based on community building and getting people together to grow food across London. We support a lot of different folks and scales from community gardens to school gardens to home growers, allotments and indeed larger peri-urban farms. Um, these graphics show some of the original achievements uh, and since the initial campaign We've welcomed our 3,000th member or growing space. Um, our members cover 200 acres of growing spaces and we estimate that that comes to about 380 tonnes of produce grown per year across those spaces. Um, we offer a map and database tool for growers um, to access and use. We deliver food growing training to over um, a thousand people over year and we champion ecological food growing through that programme. Um, we run volunteering and networking events every year. We're basically a one stop shop for offering signposting and funding and supporting folks into work and we create spaces for grassroots activity like our recent national Good to Grow um, weekend of action and generally we just want growers and growing projects to feel connected and part of something bigger by joining our network and we see our role very much as promoting the benefits of urban food growing and also influencing um, policy. I should add that it's um, free to join the network, there's lots of perks and I'm not sure where everyone's joining um, uh, from today, but uh, do check out our network and our sister network, Good to Grow, especially if you think these might be the support that we offer might be relevant across your networks and with the different community groups that you uh, are involved with. Um, but I'm going to move on to the P words now, the uh, pandemic. Um, we all know there was a surge in growing your own. Seed packets were flying off the shelves this time last year and as, as a result we've all got green fingers now which is great uh, but on a more serious note we were facing this enormous crisis, uh, the pandemic and Brexit too which made communities look urgently at how we create more resilient food supplies and diversify where and how we grow our food and you just need to look at some of the stats around you know how much fruit and veg we import to realize how precarious our food system is and 1.9 million people used a food bank last year which is just not okay so on a practical and local level we saw our community gardens mobilize themselves increase their yields uh, identify surplus produce sometimes from allotment users um, 
identifying and utilizing vacant space to grow, reaching uh, the most vulnerable people in their communities who needed access to fresh, healthy, affordable produce the most. And in this way, taking on a new importance in their communities because they delivered vital food at a time of crisis and disruption. So I really want to make clear that community food growing is obviously not the solution to uh, food poverty. But nevertheless, urban food growing has enhanced food security and addressed inequalities in many communities up and down the country. Um, and, you know, you folks may be able to think of some examples in your area too. Um, so this is where I'd like to bring in Capital Growth's Community Harvest Initiative. Um, and across our network, we've been actively supporting over 50 gardens here in London via this initiative. And our role was to support with seeds and materials, help connect up the gardens with mutual aid groups, uh, food banks, other community groups, or directly with local families, offer food growing training and matching up the gardens with uh, mentors and champions to uh, offer further support and capacity building. And these gardens produced over five tonnes um, of produce and to donate and help feed over 6,000 families in their local communities by autumn last year. Um, and this figure, I think, only just scratches the surface of what we know has been happening in all of our cities um, over the last year and the potential for urban food growing to scale up uh, production and respond to food insecurity. Um, I'll try and put it in the chat in a moment, but I do urge you to check out some of the research that's coming out of Sheffield University, which looks at, you know, the potential to, um, if we were using our green spaces and allotments to their full potential, um, how much we could meet our fruit and veg demands in a city like Sheffield, for example. Um, so as well as this amazing act of donating and sharing food, these communities are also reclaiming bits of our damaged food system and creating more resilient communities. For example, we've seen the appetite for communities to contact their councils about accessing land um, and securing support um, for their initiatives. It's worth noting that, you know, at Capital Growth, we're working more and more with councils to help them support their food growing initiatives and then embed that in their priorities and um, strategies. Um, we've also realized how much more needs to be done, but also the potential for how community food growing can and should respond to questions of inclusion, diversity and anti-racism. And if communities in London, for example, aren't representing their diverse communities, why not? Um, this also really talks to the issue of land and who has access to it and also links in with perceptions of co around community food growing and who it's for and what we need to do to change those perceptions that it's not uh, a white middle class luxury hobby. Um, if you want to delve a little bit deeper into any of our work along the community harvest journey, please do check out our film. Um, it really tells the story so much better than me. Um, and catch up on some of our recordings and conversations that we've had recently about culturally appropriate food growing, engaging young people um, and connecting food gardens, you know, kind of much more deeply with the local community. Um, I said I wanted to touch on where the peri-urban potential kind of comes in and Sustain is working on how councils can play a bigger role in facilitating commercial food growing in our urban fringes. My colleague Rob Logan is running uh, our fringe, fringe farming, ugh, got my, my uh, words twisted there, fringe farming project. And he's looking at how we unlock some of the peri-urban potential and access more land. Um, the pilot areas include uh, London, Bristol, Glasgow and Sheffield. So please get in touch um, if you're interesting, interested in finding out more. Um, and in terms of peri-urban food growing, I think I've, I've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but the pandemic really focused our attention on how fragile our food system is. And, you know, that includes how long our supply chains are and the need to have more direct contact with um, growers. And our fringe farmers really stepped up and showed themselves to be resilient and able to meet increasing demands. There's a great report by the Food Foundation um, about the increased demand for local veg schemes, for example. Um, and it's also worth mentioning a really fascinating report 
um, that's come out recently from the New Economics Foundation and Growing Communities and the Soil Association, um, which demonstrates the social return of small scale local horticulture, um, which has always been deemed, you know, less viable. So, you know, narrow economic measures may not capture the full benefits of these alternative systems, but um, this new report, you know, widens the measure in, you know, kind of how you find value and success in something and, and shows that for every one pound spent at growing communities via their veg scheme and their farmers market, a further three pound 70 is generated in social, economic and environmental value. Um, so basically you keep the money in the community, um, you benefit the local economy and environment and potentially also alleviate some um, poverty. Um, I want to finish off by delving just a little bit deeper into the climate and nature crisis and where the potential is for community food growing to play a bigger role in um, the projects that we're um, excited about. So we've got a really serious climate crisis going on and we know that urban food growing is great for bringing people in communities together and yes there's lots of evidence uh, about the benefits for physical and mental health but it turns out these urban spaces also offer some solutions in responding to the climate and nature emergency, including uh, incre increasing biodiversity and creating important wildlife corridors. Um, I came across a really, so this is a bit of a side note, but I came across a really interesting piece of research about how important our urban gardens and community gardens specifically are um, for uh, pollinating insects. So, you know, like really compelling stuff. Um, so with our new climate related project that we're working on at Capital Growth, we'll be exploring the connection between the climate crisis and community food growing. And over the next three years with funding from uh, City Bridge Trust, we'll be coordinating a program of activities to increase the status and protection of community gardens across London, um, looking at developing a new designation for community gardens and um, alongside that a practical programme to engage and build capacity and support for those growing spaces. So the funding is really going to enable us to better understand but, but crucially measure and you know investigate how growing food in the city plays a role in mitig mitigating climate change and how, how significant this role is. Um, so currently we don't have many stats and we want to make the case for protecting gardens and, um, you know, kind of tying in with this really urgent climate agenda. Um, examples of what we'll be uh, looking into are um, how much food growing spaces impact the environment locally and how much they cut pollution, um, give, giving people access to green space. Um, how much growing spaces cool the local climate or prevent flooding and create food uh, at a fraction of the carbon footprint. So if you want to find out more about the project or how to get involved, we'd really love to hear from you. We're right at the beginning stages. So um, yeah, do get in touch. Um, and some final reflections, I suppose, from me, we've seen uh, particularly over this last year how urban food growing has tackled major issues such as uh, food poverty and our unjust food system and the potential for urban food growing at a local level to reduce food miles, uh, respond to the climate and nature emergency, address food poverty and create more resilient communities, I really believe shouldn't be underestimated and there are more ambitious projects starting up every day. So it's not cheery to think about future waves of the pandemic or indeed all the many other future disruptions that we face, um, but our urban food growing communities are arguably more mobilised now and, and more ready to face some of these and, and play a bigger role. So I think the power of food growing and addressing these issues and fighting for more justice around access to land and opportunities for the many, not the few, is uh, really exciting. Um, so I'm going to end there and uh, thank you so much for your time. Amazing, thank you so much, Faye. It's great to see the way that the um, that food growing spaces respond it's the shock it's like the, the shock of the pandemic and the way that community crew growing wet spaces stepped up and pasting that over onto what the kind of shocks that climate change might bring and how they're a um 
a way, a solution to and a preventer of climate change is just amazing. And I think they go completely under appreciated for that benefit. Thanks so much. OK, so another very practical way to help reduce the climate impact of our diets is to increase the availability and consumption of climate friendly foods like fruit and veg. But there are things to consider from this approach, and I'm delighted to welcome Misbeth Knockbelt, who will explain some of her research into this area. Thank you. Yeah, hi there. I've, I've got, um, yeah, these, uh, as Ruth already said, the argument goes that the uptake of uh, fruit and veg boxes, maybe, if we can get more people to benefit from those, a larger range of people, because we know that the uptake has mainly been amongst sort of higher income, middle income families. So the argument goes, if we can get a larger number of poor income, poor people to benefit from that, then maybe that is a way of, um, you know, wins for all sides. So um, I'd like to talk to you about very quickly about a project uh, that we did with Nourish Scotland here up in the central belt in Scotland, um, where we did exactly that. We, we tried to make these boxes available to some uh, households on lower incomes. And we did that mainly just to learn about what the challenges for these households were. I'll share, you, share my screen with you so you can see a couple of um, the slides here um, that I've made up. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Um, so what did we do and what did we find? What were the challenges that we learned about? And that's how really how the project was designed. Um, we made available 28 um, boxes of local organic seasonal food and some core, uh, store cupboard items because they needed those like oil and spices and that kind of thing to 28 low income households, very small project done over a couple of months, 10 weeks in fact, we delivered boxes for free to their do doorstep and we worked with two different organizations, partner organizations, one in Edinburgh and one in Falkirk, a small town in West Lothian. Um, we supported the families with online workshops right through those 10 weeks um, and we set up a Facebook group dedicated and another group on Mighty Networks for the other group where they could share their experiences and we also did some surveys and interviews to actually tap into what they were saying. Um, and the learnings were supposed to be shared with the suppliers, basically, you know, that, the idea that more people could take up on this if we made it easier for them. So in one way, in some ways, the, the project was really successful in that um, people really liked it. They felt very treated. They liked the taste of the, the veg that they would know, would never be able to afford themselves. So, so that, that was a treat for them in, in that sense. They felt um, that they were doing the right thing. This is all self-reported. They felt they had, they were cooking a wider variety of food. It was healthier meals. They involved their kids. All those were good things because they had signed up for the project to, to try and achieve that. They really liked being part of the group as well. They, and the sharing their experiences with people was really positive for them. And there was a lot of activity on the, in the Facebook, Facebook, Facebook group. Um, there were some people who had signed up for uh, to learn more about what local food there was around. They couldn't see it in the fields around Falkirk or in Edinburgh. And they just wanted to know what English food was like, local food. There was a group of Muslim women, for example, who um, just wanted to know what, what, what that was all about. And they felt they'd learned a lot of new things. Um, and some also treated it like a, a bit more of a community project. They were doing batch cooking for their neighbours and that kind of thing. So that's quite interesting as well. But also lots of challenges. Um, and they included things like they had no previous experience of these foods. So they didn't have a clue what to do with some of the stuff. They didn't recognise it. There were a lot of queries and a lot of time spent in our workshops online about how do, what do you do with the stuff? You know, how do you store it? Do you wash it? What do you chop off? How do you peel it? You know, is this fit for eating? You know, what, you know 
basically not knowing where to start. And the same with basic cooking skills. There were some households, um, everybody was asking questions about how much oil and when do you add this and how long does it cook for it to be fit for eating? When is it done? That kind of thing. Um, a lot of practical stuff being discussed on these workshops. And a, a big um, question for them was also persuading other people in their household to take part in this, to eat the stuff. There was a lot of discussion about fussy eaters, about disengaged teenagers, all that kind of stuff. And obviously lots of frustrations about going to the effort of making a nice meal with kale, whatever, you know, cabbage, the stuff that they never eat in their households before. Um, and nobody eating it, not a chance. You know, the teenager taking one look and, and leaving the room without any thoughts like more, further thoughts like that. The, the other challenge was the same winter varieties. We did this over Christmas and, and the start of the new year and there was too much kale, too much cabbage. Yeah, and some of those challenges us in Norwich could totally sympathize with. You know, we were also talking about too much cabbage, too much kale. And the effort that's required, you know, to put to put um, a good meal on the table from these boxes is significant and a lot more than normally for the family um, a lot of the time. And then there were at the same time competing pressures on their time. The young kids not going to crashes. The second lockdown meant that there was no school on. So all these pressures were significant. There was missing equipment like a functioning oven or a blender or you know even a kitchen big enough to store these big boxes of food in. You know there were technical challenges for getting online to tap into the support and we weren't able to give any other support during the pandemic. Challenges <clears throat> like missing cables and no privacy and shared devices and all that kind of stuff that we know about in terms of getting people online and benefiting from it. Um, but also I think that last point is really significant in that some people are just not up to engaging with this. They were not coping well generally. And I think the likelihood of people on poor incomes suffering from something like that, and especially if you recruit through community organizations, often preoccupied with single issues like escape from trauma or um, malnutrition or, you know, all these, then you are tapping into families that find it really challenging to find the extra time and energy that's required to do something with a project like that. Yeah. So um, it raised lots more questions maybe than answers, um, but for sure, normally, I think we'll go back to that, normally um, what we found through the surveys is that these households, what they buy normally, like most UK households, they go to the supermarkets and they get food that is clean, it's labelled, it's dated, it's got instructions for how to cook it. And a lot of the what these families are normally buying is stuff that is already half prepared. It's processed foods, it's in tins or it's frozen because it's cheaper. Um, yeah, it's not raw ingredients that we were giving them. So actually what we were asking them was to completely change the world, the way they do their foods and to add considerable energy and time to what they were already doing, or what they what they normally would be doing. It was a huge challenge. I think we underestimated how much of a challenge this would be for them. And so the questions that were raised for us was, if we're going to be serious about getting these foods, you know, that come in the veggie boxes normally, um, to a lot wider range of people, then we need to put a lot more support in place. We need to lower the threshold. We need to make it easy for them. Yeah. We need to have support in place that's longer term reliable. The issue of, you know, if you're subsidizing food is creating dependencies. What happens when you stop subsidizing that food is a real challenge that all these organizations talk about. And you need to address all the challenges because if any of them missing, it's not going to happen for these people. Yeah. Um, I think another issue in our uh, project was ensuring that uh, the families have autonomy and choice. And that means following their suggestions about what foods and, and what pace you introduce them. You know, giving a family a big food box 
um, that serves a whole household where there's only a single mom with a couple of young kids. It's just, you know, it's not very helpful. And um, autonomy and choice, maybe what you can do is look at what they normally eat and suggest if they eat potatoes that you get, they replace it with more sustainable potatoes or, you know, better potatoes somehow. Maybe that's a more sensible idea than, um, you know, the, one way of doing this introduction thing in a gradual sort of way. There are lots of wider um, questions for us about how you make this easier for people in a way that um, people are very limited in resources, especially low-income families. Um, you need to make them, I think, into convenience foods, which means they need to be somehow convenient and familiar. Maybe we could have producers doing more washing, or we could do something about standardizing the portions, like a whole cabbage for a small family, and just giving that to them is maybe also not, you know, a lot more processing is, I think, we need to do to mainstream this stuff. Um, maybe we need to do some preparation, maybe we need to freeze some of the stuff to get it to them. Um, and certainly we need to make it available locally in convenience stores, <laughs> in a place like um, Falkirk where we ran this project, there weren't any shops where you could get any of this stuff, so you'd have to, the only option was to order it online. So not very helpful, not very convenient if anything. So the last slide on the kind of summary, summary of all. What we learned, lots of challenges, lots of scope for doing more to make these uh, foods convenient and attractive to people with limited time and resources and remembering that there are lots of people with limited time and resources. There are good reasons for um, getting food to be convenient. And we have a long way to uh, go if we're thinking about mainstreaming these foods. Uh, but really kind of the wider message that we were reminded of when we were, um, you know, rushing for deadlines and trying to all do this before the funding ran out and near the end of two or three months, is that when you do things like that, you, when you do it with people rather than to people, then things are always better. So maybe that's a very positive note to end on in terms of there being lots of different ways of doing this. and a lot of suggestions on how we can improve on any of this. I wrote a blog about exactly this. I can put the link in the um, in the chat if you like to follow it up if you like. That would be great because we had a few a question in the chat for that and I didn't have a link so thank you that would be great. Thanks so much it's absolutely fascinating because it's it's just that process of going through everything to think about is so important and I think we, you know, we really want to encourage fruit and veg accessibility to be seen as a real climate change solution at a local level, but it needs to come with all of those considerations. It's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Cecily, were there any questions that you picked up on the chat that you'd like to pose to the panel? Panel. Yes, the three of us. there were a few. Yeah, sorry. I hope everyone can hear me. My internet's being, it's decided it's had enough of the festival. Can you hear me? It's fine. It's great. Yeah. yeah it's um, okay. So Emily, <laughs> Emily from Brighton has asked that. This is one for you, Ruth. Um, the slides that you showed showed the impact of beef and lamb and how it kind of makes it a no-brainer that obviously that's a big problem. But if you were to use the normal greenhouse gas emissions equivalent figures, they don't take into account the fact that methane, which is produced by cows, is a super powerful greenhouse gas, but lasts for just 12 years, whereas carbon dioxide from fossil fuels hangs around for tens of hundreds of years. Mm. So if we, if we don't take this into account, are we letting fossil fuel companies off the hook and making farmers a bigger part of the problem than we should? Yeah, oh, oh God, I'm not really a client, but I just generally think the greenhouse gas footprint stuff, you've got to take it with a massive pinch of salt because there's all sorts of assumptions built into, built into that. Um, I actually think that at the moment, in terms of government policy and general awareness, I think fossil fuels and electric vehicles and transport and stuff is, is doing quite well in public awareness, but food is doing less well. So actually, I think... Um, I actually no. I actually think that we're fossil fuel companies are getting a lot less let off the hook than big ag. So I would almost argue that we need to do that. That we do need to put more pressure on the 
food, food system rather than food being thought of as an individual problem that we've all got to make our own choices about. It's like, you know, recognizing that the, 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 even when we walk into the supermarket, our choices are not our own. They are dictated by um, a series of quite scary and different decisions that's encouraging us to keep eating a climate unfriendly diet that suits multinational corporations and big ag. But I, th so, so, but I would say that just generally carbon footprint calculators are a bit all a bit dodgy in every sector. So it's worth remembering that it's not just greenhouse gas emissions. It's also the nature emergency. It's also the health. It's also about... Um, biodiversity and ecosystems. So there's always ways to argue or present different figures in ways that can suit different you know, issues. I hope, that's an, I hope that's an answer. Was there anything, any others? Yeah, thanks very much, Ruth. There was also one from Sam in, from Southwark. And she said that, um, that she's heard that with the current school food standards, it may be tricky to remove meat from school menus. So does anyone now have any experience with this? So that's actually got a plan to go almost vegetarian for its school meals. Yeah, no, it's definitely possible. I mean, we wouldn't suggest dropping meat oh. completely, but oh, there are ways definitely to go less and better. Um, less and better would be the, the route that I would go down. Is, is, maybe there's somebody in the bigger group that would have a, an opinion on that. I'd open it up to somebody to unmute. Can I speak here? <laughs> Um, I know in Leeds, um, catering Leeds, who, who do most of the uh, primary schools in Leeds, they have uh, they go meat free twice a week and they're really pushing vegetables. So it, it, it is possible um, and it's going down well. I would be interested in finding out more because in Brighton, when we looked at the school food standards, you have to have a set amount of days that include meat. And it seemed like you could only have three meat free days in every 10 or 15 day cycle. I can't remember exactly. In the school food standards yeah that seemed to be it because we were sort of aiming sorry sam here um yeah because we were sort of going to be doing the meat free monday thing anyway but it was just about pushing it further and we heard that we might come into problems so i think what you just said clarifies it yeah and the school food standards also include a fish day at the, like that you've got to have fish on the menu as well so what you can always it's it's also offering vegetarian versions that are more attractive it's, it's like it's a less and better message and I know so Leeds have done do just to do things like include like have um some meat but also a vegetarian option that's really attractive and that kids really like and they just they have an overall target to reduce the meat but then they go about it in ways that are just generally encouraging the dishes that are lower and no meat but I did sp I spoke to the caterer at Leeds and one thing they said was that they have a nightmare because the like vegetarian sausages don't come in the right pack size for schools and they're more expensive. So this has to come, this has to be a national project which sets standards nationally and makes it attractive and encouraging for manufacturers to produce the right products in the right pack size for the public sector. Otherwise, places trying to do the right thing are facing... Um, price and general those general barriers to doing the right thing so it has to come from the top I think it still has to be much better done on the national level rather than just expecting local authorities to go against the tide as it were needed joint letter to Richmond's vegan from Richmond's vegan sausages that other brands are available obviously so good um, so good those were actually all the questions that <laughs> those were actually all the questions that we had but I don't know if we this is you know if people have questions feel free to use the raise your hand and we can we can hear from you directly um yeah it is it we are at time um so I did want to just say a couple of quick things, obviously to thank the speakers so much. It was really great to hear from both of you. Um, and to say that I know at four o'clock there are um, some sessions that I can't remember the name of, but we can continue this chat um, in a forum, which Cecily will drop the uh, link to now. And I'm definitely gonna head over there in case anybody had any more questions or wanted to ask anything. So it'd be great to see you there if you fancy another 10 minutes to chat about this.
Yeah, Ruth, so just to add to that, but yeah, so the Wonder Space, I just put the link to that in the chat. So that's our virtual networking space for the festival. It's proven quite successful so far. So do head over there and, and chat to Ruth and anyone else that fancies going along. Um, also at four o'clock, it's the Food Power Peer Mentor Regional Learning Networks. That's so <laughs> don't worry, Ruth, I wasn't expecting you to remember <laughs> it. But um, so that's for the Southwest, the Southeast, Wales, the Northwest, the northeast east england and central england um, so if you are a member of the food power network then you should have received uh, dialing details from your food from your respective food power peer mentor but if you haven't then please email foodpoverty at sustain.web um, and we'll get the link to you um, i just put that email oh that's not the right one i've missed the why but um, i'll get that in there um, so if you haven't got the link, just send us an email and we'll get the right one over to you. But please do join those sessions at four because it will be interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to head over to that other space now. So I'll see some of you there. But I've also put my presentation into Google Docs. So and I've attached a link. So if you wanted any of the graphs or any, you can you can access that there. But I will let you filter out now. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found this session useful and I hope to see a few of you in the other group. Enjoy the rest of the festival.